the other night, we were uh, sitting around the dinner table when our daughter spoke up and asked, she said, uh, if we're driving and there's stop signs all around and I'm stopped at the stop sign and somebody crashes into me, what do I do? Our Augustine is almost five years old and she's trying really hard to understand the concepts of um, being legal, obeying the law, and consequences. And I said, well, sweetie, um, when you can begin to drive, um, then I'll explain things to you. But I'm afraid that I, that I don't think you really understand if I explained it. Augie, with confidence, said, I can. <laughs> I said, okay. So I began to explain, um, you know, car insurance. I'm not even sure she knows what insurance is. Uh, but how you would need to file a claim, and then if necessary, you'd get the police involved. And, and I just began to go on and on and on, trying to explain every single detail. Stephanie, um, my wife, wisely said, well, <laughs> you'd call mommy and daddy and we'd take care of it. Ah, you know, I was getting there. <laughs> Not really, but um, I actually, um, I like Stephanie's answer way better than mine. But Augustine is at this innocent age where she believes the absolute best in people. And, and she has a hard time understanding why anybody would do anything bad, like break the law. In fact, when we asked her about, you know, on a, uh, every day, what do you want to pray for? It's often that she says, I want to pray for the whole wide world and all the bad people. And she's just starting to grasp the need for police, for the law, for consequences, for breaking the law. And all of those details are getting worked out through a question like, what do I do if I'm obeying the law and somebody disobeys the law? What do I do when I'm stopped at a stop sign and somebody uh, hits me because they didn't stop? In other words, <laughs> what is she to do when she's in the right but somebody else is in the wrong? It's, a, it's really, it's a deep question with a real life situation attached to it. And, and honestly, I don't know a person who hasn't wrestled with that question a time or two. I mean, what are you supposed to do when you're in the right, but somebody steps out of line and it affects you? It interrupts you. It, in a negative way, it, it damages something in your life. It hurts you or it hurts somebody that you love. What do you do then? How are you supposed to respond when somebody's breaking of the law affects you? It's no doubt a hard question and it requires a lot of thought. But one thing that is um, even more difficult to grasp is the fact that there is more to life than simply obeying the law. Strictly being le uh, legal and living as a law-abiding citizen is important, but it should not and it is not the end for which we live our lives as Christians. There must be something greater that we live for and that we hold each other accountable for. In, in fact, you can argue that some of the greatest citizens, um, some of the greatest rule followers of our day tend to miss something critically important about life. Uh, this is true in Jesus' day as well, right? In the first century, there were groups of people who followed all of the law, all of the customs of the land, but they missed the greater call. And Jesus, living for the greater call, he oftentimes <laughs> got in trouble by these strict rule followers. Uh, so what is the greater call that we should live for? I mean, is there a law that is um, more important that somehow outranks simply being legal? Here's one example from the life of Jesus where we find a legal and moral rub between Jesus and the strict <laughs> rule followers of his day. Mark chapter 3. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, Jewish church, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? Jesus is challenging everyone to live for the greater call, the greater law. And so how did they respond? It says, But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn heart. Jesus is actually angry with Bible-believing, rule-following Jews because they are so focused on keeping their laws that they actually neglected a greater law. 
And so in front of them all, he decides to show them how to live for this greater call. And this got him into significant trouble, right? Uh, this is what it says. It says, Jesus said to, that, uh, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Two groups, two groups. They did not like each other. Politically speaking, they were on very different lands. They did not agree politically, but they agreed on something in this instance. Jesus is a problem and we need to get rid of him. And as you read on through the Gospels, you find many attempts by these groups to find some sort of legal trap to get Jesus in trouble. And the Pharisees and the Herodians, they were pros at knowing the law. You went to them if you wanted to know the law. I mean, following the law and even bending the law in such a way so that they could get what they wanted without getting in trouble. It's these guys. They were excellent at what they did. They were absolutely brilliant. But they missed something big, like really, really big. And Jesus called them on the carpet for this. And as a result, <laughs> Jesus was in deep water with these guys. What we see with Jesus is that he intentionally challenged the religious leaders of his day to live for something greater than simply being legal, to, but to live for the greater law, the greater call. And it appears that the same lie that gripped the religious leaders in Jesus' day was also grabbing hold of the Corinthians, um, the Christians in Corinth, because they had found ways to live under the law all the while neglecting the greater law of Jesus. And so what is the situation that we find in the church in Corinth and what can we learn from them for our lives today? Well, if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 today. And so as you're turning there, let me go ahead and give you a little bit of context. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, there's a situation in the church in Corinth um, where there, uh, there's two Christians. They're likely wealthier Christians and they encountered some kind of financial problem with each other. One Christian had defrauded and cheated another one out of um, some kind of financial um, situation, um, probably having to do with property. And so the angry Christian who is wrong decides to take legal action to bring them, to bring this man to court. And Paul is really, really bothered by this. And here's why. It's because one is, he's just flat out being crooked. And the other one is choosing to be... Um, Choosing to be legal, but at the expense of this greater law. And this is where we pick up our story. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Paul says, If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Paul cuts right to the chase um, that the issue he's addressing. And make no mistake, when, when this letter is read publicly... Everybody in the room knows exactly who Paul is talking to, right? They are singled out here. And that word dispute, it doesn't mean two people who have a disagreement and they're arguing. This is actually the technical word that you would use for a lawsuit or taking legal action. Now, this strikes us as odd today. I mean, why is Paul speaking against these people settling a matter in a court of law? I mean, for us, this is, this is like the normal way that you go about addressing legal issues, well, in the ancient world, somebody who had a, um, who had a higher social standing or uh, had deep pockets, they had, to, they had the ability to turn the court rulings in their favor. Uh, so going to court is not always a place where you are going to be treated fairly. Um, in, in fact, you're going, to, you're going to go to court when you feel like you have some confidence to be able to pull some strings and to get the favor to, to be in your, to get the ruling to go in your favor. And that is likely what's happening in the church in Corinth. And so it's possible that Paul, knowing the world that he lives in, is seeing one Christian defrauding another. And so to get back at him, he decides to leverage his own social standing to defraud this guy back, you know, uh, to get some revenge, but to do it in a legal way. And Paul calls these courts ungodly because uh, this is not a group of people who are Bible-believing people. They're not interested in making sure their laws and their values line up with biblical values. But there is also the sense that um, 
the way in which they go about justice is not the way that God lays out in Scripture. Like, their idea of justice doesn't line up with God's idea of justice. And, and so these Christians, they're going to court isn't just because, you know, he's been wronged and he's trying to make things right. It's, it's, it's really this man is taking legal action in Corinth so he can get around his greater responsibility, so he can get around um, his, this greater law that he's called to live for. And he knows the courts will rule in his favor, and so he goes that way. And this is this selfishness, um, it just kind of pervades all throughout this. But selfishness aside, Paul has another issue. Uh, verse 2 and 3. He, Paul says, Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you're to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels how much more the things of this life? This is not something that many people think about or probably um, are too well aware of. But according to the Bible, when God decides to judge the world, He includes His kids in this process. He, he brings them into this process, including angels. Which, according to the Jewish and, and the Christian thought um, back then, there were evil angels who were responsible for corrupting the world for sin. And so there would be this judgment of those evil angels. And so Paul says, the most important place of judgment in world history, God is going to entrust to his church. And he says, but here you are, bickering and fighting and suing each other over ordinary matters of life. Here's how this translates into um, modern ling English. Get your act together, you knuckleheads. <laughs> like, right? Paul continues, verse 4. He says, therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? Paul says the very people and the very systems that at the end of time you will re be responsible to sit in judgment over to decide their case. You're bringing your issues to them. And the way Paul phrased this is, um, is, is very, is deeply sarcastic in, here. Where you would go, you'd read this and you'd go, oh, I, I, I guess, Paul, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? And Paul goes, exactly. And, I mean, imagine how silly it would be to approach an atheist and say, hey, I want you to teach me how I can deepen my relationship with God. Or imagine you, you, you went to a mob boss, right? And you said, hey, I want you to tutor me on the laws of justice. <laughs> imagine how silly it would be uh, to go up to your kid and say, hey, can you coach me? Can you instruct me on how to drive properly, right? <laughs> it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And that's Paul's point. That's why Paul says this uh, in verse 5. He says, I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Is there no one who has their head on straight to teach you how to live for the greater law? Paul says, and apparently in Corinth, no. <laughs> so continuing in verse 6, he says, But instead, one brother takes another to court in this in front of unbelievers. The real danger is that they are taking something that should be a trivial matter. They're making a mountain out of a molehill. And they are dragging this nasty, backbiting, Jerry Springer kind of drama before the very people that Jesus has called them to go out and to witness to, to save. And it's, it's, it's like they, they say to the courts, Hey, after, you know, we come to you and you sort out who it is that buys um, dog food and who's responsible for doing the dishes today, you know, because apparently we can't, we can't get our act together and, and figure things out without threatening each other with a lawsuit. After we get all of that situated here, you want to come to church with us? I mean, those guys in the court who are listening to what's going on are going to look at each other and go, um, now, I know we don't have everything together, but ain't no way I'm stepping foot in that church. <laughs> Uh, they give a whole other definition to the word dysfunctional. I mean, they, they make the, the courts around town look glorious. Why would anyone even give Jesus a fair hearing when those who are speaking about him are as dysfunctional even more so than those that they're called to save? And he says this in uh, verse 7. 
He says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Nobody is winning. Not one. Not the church in Corinth. Not the citizens in Corinth. Not even the one who is being wronged and is trying to pursue the right way to go about the situation. I mean, it's a totally defeating situation. Instead, what they um, should have done to begin with is they should have begun by living for the greater law rather than simply trying to follow all of these laws. He says this. He says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brother and sister. And here's the toxic lie. Here is the toxic lie that they are believing in the city of Corinth, in the church of Corinth, the, the lie that they have fallen prey to. The lie is this. If it's legal, it must be okay. If it's legal, it must be okay. <laughs> What they were doing by taking each other to the court in Corinth, it was perfectly legal. It was within their own legal rights as citizens in Corinth. And from a legal standpoint, there was nothing wrong with what was being done. Somebody wronged another and the matter was being settled in a court of law. In fact, this is, this is how you would expect a normal proceeding to take place in Corinth. They are living as Corinthian rule followers in their day. What's wrong with that, Paul? Why do you have beef with this? Well, when you pull back the veil, you see an ulterior motive at play. And Paul deliberately, he draws this out into the open. They're skirting around what they know they should be doing so that they can get what they should not have. And they know the right step forward is asking the question, what does God want me to do with this situation? What does God want me to do? And what they should have done is they should have gotten a godly perspective by taking into account God's word and getting God's wisdom from his people. Instead, they're asking the question, what do I want to see happen here? What do I want to see happen to this man? And they are pursuing an option that would bring them greatest satisfaction to their own, their own selfish desires. These individuals, they are skirting around the, their greater responsibility by hiding behind just being legal. And we see this all throughout history. Kind of like the time when Jesus on the Sabbath, he stood up and he asked the rule followers of his day, which is better, to do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? Jesus exposes these individuals who are hiding behind the lie that if it's legal, it must be okay, right, Jesus Right, Paul? And Paul says, there is so much wrong for thinking this way. And one of the greatest issues is that asking that question oftentimes leaves people feeling justified to do things how they see fit rather than living for their greater law, for God's greater law of what He expects and He calls us to live out. And so what, you may be asking yourself, is that greater law? What is it that the religious leader is in Jesus' day and the Christians in Corinth, what is it that they missed? What is that greater law, that greater call? Well, in the great chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, this is the message, this is the passage that is um, brought up at some point during a wedding service. Um, this is what gets read, right? And here's what Paul says, and he hammers this point home. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3. He says, if I give all I possess to the poor, and I give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul says, you may win this court trial against your brother in Christ, but please realize you gain nothing in the process. This is not the loving thing to do. Your, greatest, your greater law, your greatest responsibility is not your vindication. It's your responsibility to love. Paul closes out the letter of 1 Corinthians uh, with this command. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 14. He says, do everything. Whatever you do, all of it, filter it through this. Do everything in love. Paul says, in case you missed, Corinth, what I've been trying to get at my, with the, uh, my entire letter, let me just go ahead and remind you how things should operate in the church of Corinth. Do everything in love. 
Andy Stanley, who is a pastor in Georgia, he says all the time when, and throughout his messages, and he asks this question all the time. He says, we must continually ask ourselves this one question. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? Yeah, but Paul, he ripped me off. <laughs> the least I can do is pay him back for what he's done. Yeah, but what does love require of you? But Jesus, don't you know that the law says do not work on the Sabbath? And, and this man, Jesus, he could have come in any day last week. But no, he decides to come in on the Sabbath when we're not supposed to be working. Yeah, but what does love require of you? In fact, check this out. Paul, Paul doesn't just say that love is like really important, super important. But he ranks love as the chief end that we're supposed to live for. We might even add that this is above many of our own legal responsibilities cross-culturally. Here's what he says, Galatians 5.14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Paul, are you sure you want to make that bold statement? I mean... The entire law, that's like a, that's a pretty hefty document, Paul. I mean, we're talking like 600 plus commands. You really want to say that all 600 plus can be summed up in one command? Paul says, here it is. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul, what gives you the audacity to claim that right? That that law above all of the other laws? Paul says, uh... <laughs> That's easy, Jesus. Here's what Jesus said when he was asked about, what is the greatest command? A religious leader trying to trap Jesus legally says, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in all the law? And Jesus says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Matthew 22, verse 39. He says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Before Jesus left earth, he made sure he was crystal clear about what he expected from his disciples. John 13, 34 says this. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus doesn't just say, love as you feel you ought to love. Love as your feelings dictate. Love as you, the world defines love. Love as far as it is legally and culturally okay. Jesus says love in the same exact way that I have loved you. Which, boy, that takes the whole love your neighbor as yourself to a whole nother level, right? It puts it in a different category. I mean, Jesus' love, it was totally different. It was totally unlike any kind of love on this planet. It was sacrificial. It was completely selfless. Jesus didn't treat people like they deserved it. For what they deserved. Jesus didn't treat people in the way that would bring him a greater benefit. Jesus loved people. And he did what was ultimately in their best interest. Right? He sacrificed his own life so that they could be saved. And Jesus' half-brother James which, take that in for a moment, right? This guy lived under the very same roof, under the same roof as Jesus. They ate at the same table together, right? This guy knew his brother, and he thought his older brother, Jesus, went a little bit cuckoo for the things he was doing and saying around town. And so, at one point, the family had this intervention saying, we got we to gotta get Jesus and straighten him out. He's, he's, he's bringing shame to our family. Well, this brother, he ends up becoming a pastor, worshiping, believing that his older brother is not just this really smart guy, but the son of God. After he was resurrected, he was given proof, and he becomes a pastor. And listen to what he says. James 2, verse 8. He says, if you really keep the royal law, right, royal law, that is the highest law. This comes directly from the king. This is the king's edict. This is higher than all else. James says, if you're really living for that as found in Scripture, what is the royal law found in Scripture? Love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. James says, look, if you are living for the greater law, <laughs> you are doing right. And we have Paul who says, love fulfills all the commands in the law. 
Jesus tells us that the greatest command that he wants us um, to live for is this. In James, the half-brother of Jesus says, love your neighbor. It is the royal law. It is the king's edict. This is the chief and we're supposed to live for. And the Christians in Corinth thought, well, if it's legal, must be okay, right? <laughs> and Paul shouts back, but if it is done in the name of breaking your higher law, the law that you are called to live for, to love each other, then it is not okay. It is not okay with me. Paul says it is not okay with Jesus. It is not okay with anyone. Paul says what you should have been asking each other this whole time, throughout this whole court proceeding, before it even got to that point, is what does love require of you? How would Jesus have expressed his love in this situation? Paul says, let me go ahead and answer how Jesus would have answered that, how the advice he would have given you. He would have said, you should have been wrong. You should have been cheated. Instead, you are doing wrong and you are cheating back. You are pursuing revenge. And when we reflect on Jesus' teaching and his life about how we're supposed to, to respond when we are wrong, when somebody steps out of line and it impacts us, Jesus, how are we supposed to respond Jesus says, I told you, Matthew 5, verse 39. He says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slapped you on the, the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you, interesting, and take your shirt, hand over your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the, the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus doesn't say that the goal is to love those that you like or that you agree with. But love those that you do not. Love even your enemy, right? And we can define enemy however we would like to define our enemy, but Jesus' response is still the same. And this is just what we see Jesus do, right? According to the biblical understanding, there, there's only two sides to this eternity equation, right? You're either on the with God side or you're on the against God side. And the Bible says what we have to understand is that nobody was on the right side. Nobody was on the right, on the right side of the fence. We were all on the not with God side. We were on the against God side. And as a result, we all, because of sin, we were opposed to God. We were enemies of Jesus. We were deserving of judgment that if we can somehow rewind the clock back to the time when Jesus would judge, we would be in the crowd yelling back, crucify him. Crucify him. That not a human is on the right side of the fence. And Paul says this in Romans 5, 6. It is so powerful. He says, for at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus loved even those who were considered ungodly, who were considered powerless, who were considered enemies of God. And so if this is what Jesus' love looks like, what does love require of us? I think it calls everyone to, accept, to not accept the lie that if it's legal, it's okay, right? Because there's times, I mean, in Corinth, where what was legally permissible was actually scripturally contradictory, right? And Paul would say that if you are operating in life with just going on, just going along with what the law says, with what is legal, what is the legal way of living, then it will at some point lead you to compromise on your greater law that you are called to live for, the greater responsibility that we have, which transcends all time, <laughs> all culture, all continents. And when that happens, your loyalty are to be focused on the greater call from God, not the lesser calls of man that seem to change place to place. And what Paul is getting at here with this situation with Corinth feels very applicable today. I mean, Paul is dealing with two people who both, they feel rightfully wrong. <laughs> There's fraud in the church, right? There's blame. I mean, there's anger. 
there's lawsuits. And Paul, looking at those two individuals, he calls out the elephant in the room. He says, what you are doing to attack your brother, though it is legally valid, it is disobedience to the royal law you are ultimately called to live for. What you should instead be asking yourself is, what does love require of me? In our day and age, where literally adherence to um, two different political parties are demonizing each other, we both, from both sides of the fence, we have to ask that same question. What does love require of me? We, not, we may not personally be bringing any lawsuits against somebody else of a, of a different persuasion. But are we taking out our frustrations in a public format? Like the, the Christians in Corinth are bringing this before a public format court to decide the case? Are we bringing our complaints, our frustrations into a public arena where those we are called to reach can look at us and go, man, if they don't know how to get, if they don't know how to get uh, to, to love those they disagree with, how could they ever welcome me in not being a Christian? And I fear that just as Paul, as he writes this chapter, he is so concerned for the reputation of the church in Corinth because of the situation that, that, I mean, even today, Christians and churches all over have the potential to blow up and annihilate relational bridges with those whom we disagree with but are called to reach. We're called to reach. And in the public arena, wherever they may be, there is a watching and there is waiting to see how Christians and churches respond. And I'm, I'm not saying you have to agree with everything going on. Please don't agree with everything going on, right? If it's legal, it must be okay. It's not the right way to operate. I'm saying that we have to value the greater call of loving our neighbor more important than our desire to demean or defend ourselves. Right? That's what Paul's getting at here. My daughter asked the question, when I'm not obeying the law, somebody breaks the law, what do I do? What am I supposed to do? The way in which our world operates, the rhetoric of our world says, get even, get revenge, make it right, stand up for yourself, put others down, build up yourself. And in a world where everybody is justifying all kinds of legal and illegal actions, where a world in which um, they, people feel entitled to inflict pain because they feel a deep amount of pain, the question we should begin to ask is, what does love require of me here and now? Because I can tell you how Jesus answered that question. He went to the cross. He died for our sin, the sin that made us guilty before a holy God, that we could stand before that holy God forgiven, not because of our righteous actions, but because of what Jesus did on our behalf. 